how's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this Inning Explain, we're looking at the recent Netflix original, The Call, where two women are connected by a phone in the same house, but 20 years apart, and a serial killer puts one woman's past and life on the line to change her own fate. Right, so The Call is one of those magical phone that can communicate through time kind of deals, and you know, changing things in the past affects the present. And no, we don't ever find out why the phone is magic. It's just magic. Deal with it. This is maybe a bit reminiscent of Frequency, but geez, that's already 20 years old at this point, and so a new take on that concept is perhaps overdue. Fortunately, The Call does a lot of interesting things with its concept, and actually did have some nice surprises and twists that I didn't see coming. It does well at evolving how things correlate between times in important ways, while also spending a lot of time developing our two leads burgeoning friendship between time, which naturally takes a much darker turn when we start to learn who Young Sook really is. It does get a bit confusing and hard to follow as more and more time shenanigans are occurring, and in particular the very end gives us one more surprising bit twist that changes everything. So let's dive into the call, breaking down the time hopping story, including what we learn about our two main characters and who they really are, along with explaining the ending and its final big twist. In a quite lovely landscape, a young woman, Seo Yin, totes her luggage. A small van approaches, backing up to give her a ride, spotting on the back that the man Sung Ho is a neighbor strawberry farmer. Seo Yen is returning to her old family home after many years, and learned that her mother is in the hospital. She has apparently lost her phone. He offers to use his, but she remembers there is a landline inside. He sighs, calling their house still the best in the village, and it seems nice enough on the outside. Inside is a different story, all but abandoned and run down for years. Seo Yen going around the house to open curtains to let some dang light in the place. She finds that old cordless phone and plugs it in, dialing her cell number. She's greeted by a voice, asking to come and get it, and they seize the opportunity to ask for some cash in exchange. And they simply say they'll call back and hang up. She tries to call again, and it doesn't go through for some reason. She uses her laptop to trace the phone's location and gets another call. But it's not who found her phone, but a girl, Young Sook, saying that her mom is insane and has locked her in the house. Baffled, she asks who she's trying to reach, and thinking it must be a wrong number, hangs up. At the hospital, we discover that her mother is ill with a brain tumor that must be removed. The doctor's voice fading away into a ringing noise. She discusses with her mother, and the surgery is exceedingly expensive. Her mom suggests a friend of hers who works in insurance to take care of the payment. And besides, it's not like she can make up 100 million won, which is about 92 grand USD, working at a convenience store. It's not made clear why exactly yet, but Seo Yin despises her mother. When she asks if she should be buried with or beside her father, she sees, how could you say something like that, thinking that she deserves to be buried next to him. Frustrated, she throws down her apple and puts on her coat, leaving in a huff. She then pays a visit to her father's grave, and later comes home to the phone ringing. It's Young Sook again, again saying her mom is trying to kill her, begging her to come over now. She says that she was dialing someone called Soon Hee's store, but Seo Yin thinks that she's just playing a joke and hangs up. Later, passed out on the couch, we see that she has burn scars of some kind on her legs. She's awoken by a loud clatter, and searches the house, not finding anything. That is, until she goes to hammer a nail into the wall, and it passes right through, appearing hollow on the other side. She rips open a larger hole in the wall, big enough to see through, peering down to a set of stairs leading further below. There she finds a plush teddy bear in a chair. She cautiously approaches a box, finding belongings stuffed inside, including a diary and a bunch of pictures of one dude marked August 1999. There's mentions of fire flooding that repels ghosts by burning them. And mother sets me on fire, she reads. A photo falls out of a young girl but she doesn't recognize her. She asks Sung Ho if he does, and he does, muttering her name is Young Soo. Based on the belongings found, she asks if she was a shaman. No, but her mother was, he informs her. He remembers only vaguely that the mother and daughter lived in the house back in the 90s. She tries to ask for more details, but his dog, appropriately called Strawberry, takes his attention away. Seeing the photo of the girl is dated November 26, 1999. Passing through town, she stops at Sun Hee's store, the woman mentioned on the phone by Young Sook, and girl Growing frightened quickens her pace. Staring into the hole in the wall, the phone rings, begging Soon Hee to come help, sounding exasperated. Going on, her mother is setting her on fire. 
followed by thumping and loud screams. We then peek back to 1999, Young Sook being dragged down the hall by her mom, the phone seen on the ground. She lights a weird ball thing on fire. She tries to run but gets caught, dropping the flame thing on the stairs, seeing in the present smoke still coming out of the hole, and clicks on her flashlight, noticing the stairs are now charred and smoldering, seeing the direct aftermath of what occurred 20 years ago here. Later, she calls, asking why she didn't come yesterday. Seo Yin asks her address, and learns that they are indeed in the same house she's in now, but again 20 years earlier. She brings up seeing her picture from the 29th, but Young Sook is confused, as it's only the 18th right now. She asks about what she saw in the diary about her mother's oppression, and matches what she told her. Young Sook thinking that she must be watching her somehow. She goes on, explaining that even if it is hard to believe, they are living in the same house. And to prove this, she does an internet search for November 18th, 99, finding a story about a plane crash that occurs later that night. Sitting down for what looks to be a fairly unappetizing dinner, Young Sook's mom commands that she eat it, while she is entranced by a fried chicken joint commercial. Mmm, looks good. She stabs at the offering, scoffing, you call this food? And she throws back, oh, you want to go back to the mental institution and wind up like your mother? Clarifying that she's not actually her mom after all, it's her aunt. And hinting at possible mental illness at play with the girl. She angrily starts stuffing her face with food, shoveling more and more in. Her mom grows angry and pulls her hair back, chalking up this all happening due to bad feng shui, and is hopeful that she'll be better after they leave this house. To her surprise, on the news there's word of a plane crash occurring just as she said. Young Sook calls back asking how she knew about it, and learned they both are the same age of 28. She flips through the diary, seeing many pictures of a singer, and pulls up a video playing it over the phone for her. Young Sook hasn't heard the song, and apparently this, her favorite singer, makes a comeback in 2000. Her admitting that it does sound like him, staring at her walls adorned with more photos of the singer. She regales her with more tales of the future, like the wonders of smartphones, music and photos and all that crap is now on your phone. She smirks in disbelief and asks if she can find out what happens in her life. She is about to do a search, but stops, Young Sook divulging that her mom always says that she was cursed with bad fortune and born with a brutal, atrocious fate. Oh, that's pretty dramatic. Seo Yin asks, so oh, she doesn't get along with her mom? And she reveals that her birth mom is dead. Seo Yin can relate, having lost her father in a fire at her home. And it was her mom that forgot to turn off the gas, seeing her telltale scars. And now we understand why she has a grudge against her mother, blaming her for her father's demise. The past and present soon collide in a surprising way, when young Seo Yin, along with her family, take a tour of the house back in 99. As mentioned, her faux mom wanted to sell it, and so it makes sense that it was the Kim family that moved in after them. Upstairs, her mom asks about a particular room. Ah, that's just my daughter's. She commands her to open the door. Young Seo Yin finding her scary. Mr. Kim laughs, apologizing that she didn't mean it. And Young Sook asks the girl's name, now realizing who it is. She calls her in the present, holding out the phone, hearing her family talking to the realtor. Seo Yin shooting up in amazement, and instantly tears up at hearing her father's voice. And perhaps even stranger, hears her own child-aged voice as well. She proposes that this turn of events has given her a fun idea. Perhaps she can somehow bring her dad back to life. November 27th, in fact today, is the date of his death. And Young Sook puts her plan into action. Her mom leaves, and she gets to the door just in time to sneak outside, making it to a bus and following an address Seo Yin gave her. We see her mom actually leave, which indicates that perhaps it wasn't her fault after all. She snatches a hidden key under a pot, the fire on the stove growing in intensity. We see her dad is passed out, the child taking an opportunity to play with him. The deed now done, the scars on her leg immediately vanish, and in a quite cool visual display, the ground starts to burn, and she is suddenly enshrouded in darkness. Stuff flies all around her, and things begin to reassimilate in a new way. Her surroundings now look entirely different, including even her with longer hair. The house is much brighter and more well tended to now, and she runs outside to the front of the house, staring in disbelief. Could it be? She rushes to a nearby greenhouse, finding her mom looking healthy and watering their many plants. And lo and behold, Mr. Kim emerges, showing off a frog he found. She starts tearing up and gives him a big old hug. She calls Young Sook and thanks her. Things aren't great for Young Sook, though, sporting fresh cuts on her back. Meanwhile, things are better than ever for Seo Yin. Sitting down to an impressive meal, the family reunited and it feels so good. The two time pals start to form a real bond, recording over old tapes of Young Sook's with new music music played by her over the phone, and sticks the tapes in her closet, her later seeing a hand drawing left behind on the wall, and joins her hand on it too, the two connected in a way across time. Though soon, a rift grows between them, as Seo Yin becomes more preoccupied with her family, and doesn't answer the calls as much, leaving Young Sook hurt and lonely.
lonely. Their contrasting lives are illustrated further, with Seo Yen working the grill while Young Sook sits alone, eating the exact same crap from before looking forlorn. She keeps calling and calling and getting no answer, until sometime later when returning home she rushes to her room to answer. Young Sook saying nothing at first, then asks what's wrong with her, thinking that she wanted her to call back. Seo Yen apologizes as she was out with her parents, oh she snickers, and both awkwardly laugh, brushing it off seemingly, though the laughter turns to whimpering and croaking, her breathing getting aggressive, and she starts growing upset, yelling shit, goddammit, and fucking bitch, hearing a loud clattering nearby, then a scream and a gasp. Seo Yen yells for her friend, and her mom answers, warning to not call her ever again or she'll get hurt. Down in the basement, mom ties her up and throws some dust on her or something, yelling to let her go. She jingles a bunch of shaman bells and starts whipping her mercilessly. Young Sook groaning as mom goes off on her and has a seizure falling back to the ground. Mom gets up close, speaking in tongues, and grabs her chin, flashing to someone scrubbing up blood all over the floor. As this strange ritual does seem to have given mom some kind of prophetic, horrifying psychic visions. Seo Yen wakes up startled and must not have heard from her friend in a while and does a search for her online, turning up nothing. In the past, mom dressed in black carries a chicken in a bag and comes to Soon He's store, where she spots her and runs away, but she decides to pay a visit anyway. Assumedly part of her plan to kill her faux daughter in a ritualistic way. Gotta have chickens. Seo Yen turns up a story that backs this up. The headline, Stepmom Murders Stepdaughter Via an Exorcism Designed to Cure Mental Illness. Growing concerned, she waits by the phone until it rings. Young Sook impressed that she answered so quickly today. She asks where her mom is and tells her to listen carefully, gravely stating that she thinks she's going to die tonight and that technically already did die in the house. Mom digs out a hefty knife from a fish tank, creaking into her room in the shadows. She lifts the knife and starts stabbing at the blankets, but there's no blood or anything. Wait, what the heck kind of exorcism is that anyway? Just stabbing somebody? That's weird. What was the chicken for? You just stab the shit out of one and then you eat chicken? I don't know. Naturally, thanks to the warning, Young Sook steps out and closes the door behind her. You really killed me, she whispers, then yells, demanding to know why. Certain death is your future, she claims, sending Young Sook into hysterics, laughing maniacally, and grabs a fire extinguisher and lets it rip, filling the room in a haze. She snatches the knife away, again demanding to know why she killed her. She starts speaking in tongues again, and she brings the knife down on her, blood splattering onto the wall. She calls Seo Yen, breathing a sigh of relief when hearing that her and her mother came to an understanding without going into much detail about it. She's still worried, asking if she's going to be okay. And that's not an issue. Young Sook describing feeling like she's been reborn. She finally has freedom and goes to the city, and munches down on some of that famous fried chicken from the commercial, and continues to a clothing store next door to get some fresh duds. Sung Ho comes over to the house with some fresh straws for the family in the present. Seo Yin bites down on one, leaving a small stain on her sleeve. As back in the past, he pays a visit as well, seeing that Young Sook has a whole new look and drags him inside, noticing that she has tons of clothing bags everywhere. He asks about her mom's whereabouts, but she doesn't answer, asking him to pick between two outfits. He's unsure, admitting that he doesn't know much about these things, and she groans, really? And runs off, leaving him confused. He goes to the fridge, discovering many plastic bags that apparently have quite a stank to them. One tumbles out, a blood trail emerging from the bag, and seeing a finger inside, he freaks out and backs away, terrified. Which of course is right when Young Sook returns. Frustrated, she asks why did he have to open that, and goes for her trusty fire extinguisher. She calls Seo Yin, sobbing, and hearing Sun Ho groaning, she's going to kill me. Then hearing bone snapping, Young Sook annoyed, as she just got these clothes and the call dies. Well, that's concerning. The stain on her shirt suddenly vanishes, and when coming back downstairs, Sung Ho has vanished as well. She asks her parents about it, and they have no idea who she is talking about. She rushes to his farm, finding a sign on the ground that must have been there for quite some time, and comes across a grow house now long abandoned and falling apart. Her next stop is the police station. The first officer doesn't even know who the guy is, but another pipes up, asking why she's looking for someone that died ages ago. He died? She asks, befuddled. And he retrieves a police notebook on the case. He was the victim, and Young Sook was his murderer. It had all occurred at the assailant's house. In the past, the investigation into his whereabouts is just beginning, officers showing up the house to take witness statements. Young Sook lies, as she doesn't know who he is or even about the farm. And it looks like she's about to get away with it, starting to close the door, but an officer notices the piles of strawberries. Uh, aren't those strawberries right there, huh? So they pop in on her all, oh right, he was handing them out yesterday, it must have been mom that took them. They then ask to speak with her, telling them that she went somewhere far and left two days ago. As the officer points out, this contradicts her story, 
Didn't you say that she left yesterday? All right, yesterday then. Him scratching it out and correcting the info in his notebook. Seo Yin next visits the lady store asking about Young Suk, and she describes her as being well behaved and will listen to her talk about her drunk dad. And when sometimes sneaks snacks into her room. She pulls up her leg, seeing it's all messed up, stating if it wasn't for her mom, she'd be dead now. Hmm. So maybe the actual aunt wasn't so crazy after all, as we come to learn that perhaps she had reason to keep Young Suk locked up. It'd be crazy. She calls her pal busy tending to body parts, and Seo Yen gets right to it, asking if she killed her mom and Sung Ho. She sighs, saying she has no idea what she's talking about. She reads from a paper about a serial killer being sentenced to life in prison. Life sentence? So I rot in jail for the rest of my life, she groans, and well, inadvertently spilled the beans as well. She's unwilling to give up her new life, however, and tries to use the time situation to her advantage once more, demanding that Seo Yen find whatever evidence the police discovered that damned her. She's hesitant, but reminds her about saving her dad's life and all that, and frightened, she hangs up. This only enrages Young Suk further, calling her a bitch for hanging up on her, and keeps insulting her until she hangs up again. She flips her lid, yelling at the phone, and goes nuts, punching at the bags of body parts in the sink. Understanding the sudden dark turn that things have taken, Seo Yen rips the phone out of the wall, and already she's trying to call again, blood pouring out from the sink behind her. Getting no answer, the line keeps ringing. At the police station, there's some startling news that comes in via fax, mentioning Young Suk's antisocial as well as borderline personality disorder. Uh-oh, that's not good. She continues trying the phone over and over until she's drawn away by a knock on the door. She gets her extinguisher ready and see it's little Seo Yen and Mr. Kim, as they were supposed to meet her mother earlier about the house, but she never showed up at the realtor's office. He asks if she's home, and Young Suk smirks, calling out to her to no answer, of course. Shrugging laughs, she must have fallen asleep, and invites them to wait inside. In the present, Seo Yen is with her dad, her appearing worried. He pulls over and smiles, asking her to come, as in the past, they're hanging out in the living room, unaware of Young Suk entering, walking past them with her favorite extinguisher. Mr. Kim is teaching his daughter to drive, apparently. They then approach a tunnel, just as in the past, Mr. Kim is whopped with a fire extinguisher, and instantly starts to change things due to this. Glass shatters, and her dad's face starts flaking away. The windshield explodes, her screaming, Dad, no! And the car dissolves to nothing. All she can do is watch as he's ripped away once more. Little Seo Yen backs away in the fog, seeing her slashing at her dad on the ground. In the tunnel, the lights click back on, and she's now on the ground all alone. Well, shit, Young Suk, that was pretty rude, I gotta say. She approaches the little girl, telling her it was her fault for not picking up the phone, and chides her for the mess that she's made. In the present, she's also returned to her shorter hair look and runs all the way back home, and it too has reverted to its rundown appearance. She finds writing scrawled in blood on the ground to pick up the phone, and hears it ringing. She digs through rubble to find it, asking, what did you do to my dad? She only responds that she warned her not to disconnect the phone, asking if she knows about how chickens still run around after their heads are cut off, chuckling that her dad was kind of like that. Fuck you, she yells, her cackling in response, asking how she's gonna do that. It's not like she can even come here. Oh wait, she is already here, isn't she? Seeing that she has captured her younger self and strapped her to a chair. She offers her one hour to find out how the police arrested her and goes on, oh, don't you hate your mom as well? She loses her shit, yelling and knocking stuff around. So with no other choice, she begins to search for how she was caught. As Young Sook is busy cleaning up the writing and bloody mess all over the dang place, matching up with those brief glimpses seen in her mom's visions of sorts earlier. As Yo Sin learns there was some kind of greenhouse explosion that killed two people that occurs at 5 p.m. today in the past. The key evidence was found by a junk scavenger and calls to tell her it's the knife you threw away. Police find fingerprints on it. Gotta get there before the police. This seems in fact to be a setup by Yo Sin to take her out as she goes to the junkyard just before five. A spark goes off inside the building, starting a fire with the gas tanks, causing a huge explosion that goes off when she's right outside, but doesn't get her. Well, that was a close one. Tricky, tricky, Yosin. But now she's gonna be even more pissed, I'd wager. She waits impatiently, looking absolutely terrified, and gets startled when her cell phone alarm goes off, chuckling, well, it must have worked since I'm still alive. The landline then rings, and when she finally answers it, it's the younger her on the other end. She gasps that she's scared and pleads for help as Young Sook takes the phone away. Almost had me there, she admits, asking how did such a sweet kid grow up to be such a bitch? She wonders if she'll be able to hear this over the phone, boiling some water. She pleads to listen to her, but she isn't, going on that her mom told her Peachwood is good for warding off evil spirits, thinking that she's possessed by a lying spirit, bringing up the boiling pot up to the girl, and starts counting. Seo Yen tries to apologize, but to no avail, hearing flash squelching, and 
and fresh burn scars appear on her body, screaming in pain on the ground. To make matters worse, Young Sook reveals in a sing-songy voice, guess who's coming right now? And plays a message from her mom, saying she's on her way to the house. She teases, telling her that she's got something to say she's dying to know, bringing up how her dad died in the fire. Well, it wasn't her mom's fault, and we go back to the original moment with the pot, seeing mom actually shuts off the flame, and as we remember, actually saw her leaving after this. Seo Yin is watching a weird kids program about gas and being careful when turning it on. Watch for gas, watch for fire, the stove sings. <laughs> okay, whoa. Is that a kid show? Well, it's like an acid trip. Though we don't see what happens, we see her later in the hospital with burned legs. The implication being that Seo Yin was actually responsible for the accident that killed her dad, not her mother as she led herself to believe. She wasn't even there. <laughs> Young Sook calls her an expert in this field, that of being a pathological liar, and knows how much she hates her mom, suggesting that she should just kill her for her. Desperate to stop her, Seo Yin breaks into the police station and snatches the journal for her case, reporting evidence was indeed found by a 76-year-old junk collector, and Young Sook is able to get to him first, and retrieve the knife before getting caught. Thusly, the ink starts to vanish in the journal, while mom is giving the police a statement. And that changes more in the book. That's it, though. Her annoyed, asking if they're even going to search the house. Gotta work according to protocols, he states, leaving the station disappointed. An officer runs out wanting to show her something. He asks if that was the address, mentioning a missing persons report from there. And more changes start occurring. Not just the ink, but photos of Young Sook and the knife fade away seeing that she's burning it in a trash fire and effectively destroying the evidence and getting away with all these murders. Yo! The house starts to rumble around her, things changing once more, her eyes darting around the room befuddled. Several fridges are seen, filling the entire room and an assortment of extinguishers in another, making it appear Young Sook has grown into quite a prolific serial killer. We see a woman's silhouette on the other side of a divider on the phone, overhearing, listen, you might get killed. Young Sook in the past answers the door to an officer, reading from the journal that they started searching indoors accompanied by the missing child's mother, and used a cordless phone. Yo Sin searches for the phone in the strange surroundings. The clock chimes, seeing that they are counting down to the year 2000. The officer continues asking questions about their whereabouts, as mom finds one of Seo Yen's bows on the ground, certain that it belongs to her daughter. Mom asks if she can check upstairs, Young Sook casually telling her, eh, go ahead, while Seo Yen is doing the same in the present, and sees the wall leading to downstairs wide open, and descends down to what appears to now be Young Sook's murder basement, coming across a surgical table and chair caked in blood. She finds the phone there, rushing to grab it, while in the past, they don't turn anything up. Mom, too, asks to use the phone, but Young Sook says it's broken. She grabs it anyway, hearing a dial tone. Sounds fine, she says. Seo Yen stares at it, waiting and answers. It's her mom on the line. She yells to get out of the house right now or she'll kill you. And she's bonked in the back of the head and the phone goes dead. The officer asks who it was, her confused, saying that they called her her mom and told her to run. We immediately see why this is is when Young Sook surprises the officer with a knife in the back. While Young Sook in the present asks what's wrong, didn't you want your mom dead? Seeing that she has a scar on her neck. She believes the two are in fact quite alike. The phone ringing again, both struggling to get it, flinging each other around the room. Young Sook gets her by the neck, choking her. She bites her arm to get free, and getting back to her feet, she tackles her through a wall, and finally is able to get the phone. Young Sook still in hot pursuit. In the past, Mom too runs upstairs, also being chased by her, both seeking refuge in the same room locking the door. Young Sook starts bashing at it, yelling for her to open it, and her mom calls back. She instructs her to chill and find something to use as a weapon, seeing only a fire extinguisher available. She starts breaking the door down in the present, and then in the past, hearing young Seo Yen begging for help right outside. She cracks the door open and sees her tied up on the ground and runs to her, comforting her that her mom is here. Young Sook slices her in the back, while present Young Sook smiles through a hole she's banged in the door, while Seo Yen screams to her mother, asking if she can hear her. Young Sook about to get the mom in the head with the knife. She stomps it with her hand, blood running down. The two struggle in the past, seeing new damage done in the present due to their fighting. Marks on the walls and windows shattering. Seo Yen cries. She's sorry for what she said about her, just as Young Sook gets the handle open to let herself in. She comes out licking her lips, covered in more blood descending upon the young girl, doing the same in the present. She takes out the knife, but mom gets to her first, tackling her and both plummeting over the side of the railing. The present Young Sook vanishes, her all alone in the even more run-down abode, but what happened to her mom? She runs to the hospital to her room, but it's another woman there, so she goes to the graveyard finding an updated one for her dad marked December 11th. She hears someone call her name. It's her mom, alive and well, asking why she didn't answer the phone. She's called so many times. She wonders why she's dressed like this, worried that she'll catch cold, seeing a scar on her neck and on her hand too when she hands over the scarf. What do I do with you? She smiles. If dad 
Brown saw you, he would say you're still a baby. The two leave the graveyard together, and it seems that everything worked out all right in the end. And at least she did patch up things with her mom. But not so fast, as the phone rings again, the same woman saying hello. Going back to the conversation Seo Yen overheard in the present, when things first changed into her being at the serial killer HQ, and it's actually her younger self that she's calling, giving her the heads up that she might be killed, informing her Seo Yen's mother will be arriving soon, seeing them in her eyeballs reflection. So thanks to this future warning, this must change things once again. Back to the present, Young Sook tells her to keep the phone on her if things don't work out as that's the only way they can change things. We see past Young Sook on the ground, blood pooled at her head, yet isn't dead after all, after falling over the railing. We cut back to the graveyard, seeing Si Yeon's mother blip away to nothing, meaning that what must have actually happened in the new past is that her mom must have died in their throwdown. In what we previously saw, she wasn't aware of what was coming, but obviously things will go down differently this time. All thanks to these changes, the present leads to another new victim for Young Sook, someone seen struggling under a sheet and it's Seo Yen, tied up just as her younger self was prior. Ah, dang! Wow, so after all that, Young Sook had one final failsafe in place. She was the woman on the phone in the silhouette or whatever when time changed again. It was thanks to this that prior to the final showdown, past Young Sook was able to intervene and get to her friend first. It's also unfortunate as Seo Yen was the only other one who knew about the magic phone. So with her out of the picture, it's most likely that Young Sook will indeed become the prolific serial killer seen at the end. And now there's no one who can stop her from this fate. This outcome does also tie back into her in this mutated new timeline dead ant's whole shaman thing. Initially, we were under the impression that the ant is the cuckoo one, more or less torturing her de facto daughter. Well, it is still true, I guess, but now we understand the reasoning behind it. She must have sent something off with Young Sook mentally for some time, and thanks in particular to those bloody visions, was worried of her potentially murderous future. If things had progressed without the magic phone's involvement, Young Sook would have been killed by her, ending things way before she grew into a full-fledged serial killer. But thanks to the phone and the girl's friendship, things got all kinds of messed up, resulting in a much more terrifying future for the girl. That brings us to the conclusion of the wacky time adventures of the call. I did find this one quite entertaining, and many of the twists were actually surprising. In particular, that final mid-credits one. I was like, what the fuck? I thought everything was alright. Not so fast, pal. It set out to do something specific and executed its concept quite well. There's also something about Korean movies, even if they're not like mind-blowingly amazing, they still beat the absolute crap out of most American stuff nowadays. Just something about their style, I don't know, I dig it. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media platforms at Foundflix. What did you guys think of the call and its ending? What's your favorite Korean horror flick? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.